OK, everyone, if you'd like to take your seats, we will um, get started. My name's John, and I'd just like to give a very special welcome to everybody who's here for the dedication of Wood and Enseco and Aaron and Catherine's children. It's going to be a very special time. And also a very warm welcome to those of you who are watching online. <clears throat> I'm just going to start with a quick prayer. And then I'd like us to begin a little bit unusually by <clears throat> excuse me, interacting with God before we start. So let's pray. Jesus, would you come by your spirit and bless us this morning? We welcome you here and we ask that your will be done. Your kingdom come in all of our lives this morning. Amen. Yeah, I'm, let's do this. Um, let's remind ourselves before we start of one or two things about who God is. He's borne our griefs, hasn't he? He's, he's promised to give us beauty for ashes. He's promised to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And I don't know if, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've, we've been through a bit of a global pandemic, haven't we? Has anyone, anybody noticed that? Um, quite, quite a big thing. So I suspect there's one or two things that we're maybe carrying as a result of that, which we found quite difficult. Uh, it's certainly true of me. I've certainly done that. And I'm just going to suggest that we give at least one of those things to God before we start. So the best, as best we can, and this, this might be new to some of us, let's think of something that maybe we've struggled with and let's lift it to God. Give you, give you a minute just to, just to do that in whatever way is right for you. Um. So Jesus, as your children lift to you those things which we have found difficult, would you take them please? And as this service continues, would you continue to bless us and fulfill the promise that you gave that you would exchange good things for those things that we find difficult? So Lord, come by your spirit and minister to us as we move into worship. Amen. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost, my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I
wait for a moment. Let God continue to speak to us, to bless us, to be present with us. We welcome you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you've planned. Thank you for all that you are. Okay. Um, we've got some family news, and I think we've got a slide. We've Brilliant. You're ahead of me, Tony. Extraordinary. Well done. Um, okay. Probably most of you who come here regularly know we're not taking up physical, physical collections, but there's still an opportunity for those who want to, to give to the work and to give into the kingdom of the church. And you can do that electronically, either on the website, right at the bottom of the home page, or by making a online um, transfer. Any questions anyone's got about how to do that, um, have a chat with me, because I, I vaguely know, so that would be good. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, bring and share lunch um, straight after the service. That was, that was what the food was looking like about 15 minutes ago, so um, that all should be good. You're all very welcome to stay. Um, there'll be a brief time afterwards while we're finishing up um, setting everything out, and then very welcome to go across into the Agora where the lunch is being held. If you don't know where the Agora is, uh, follow the crowd because quite a few people do, and They'll show you. Um, Salt Mine Theatre Company. Um, yeah, worldwide pandemics notwithstanding, they're coming on the 5th of December. They promise to take regular COVID tests. I suspect that might actually impact on the play itself. But they're um, performing Neverland, Peter Pan reimagined on Sunday, the 5th of December at 5 p.m. For those of you who have not been to Salt Mine, um, they're wonderful. They're a professional theatre company. They take traditional Christmas plays and they inject music, humour and an aspect of the Christian faith into that play. So if you feel comfortable coming, uh, take a Covid test beforehand, bring some friends and it'll be a, it'll be a lovely time. Um, any questions about that? Daniel is Mr Salt Mine this year. And he's, he has the answers to all of your questions. I'm losing my place in my notes. Um, well, here we are. Okay, guys, we've got three prayer points before, um, before Heather comes to preach. And the first one is changed very slightly. Um, I've got on a the slide there that David was preaching at Whiteley Free Church and he was due to be preaching but in fact David's not very well um, and he's quite uncharacteristically not particularly well because he doesn't have any energy and that's very uncharacteristic of David isn't it so Sue's asked um, if we could pray for David and also for her as well because she's walking alongside David in this time and it, it, it is quite strange David literally has very little energy, which is very unusual for David. So can we pray for David now? Jesus, we thank you for David. We thank you for all that he's brought to this church, all that he's enabled you to do within the church. And we pray now for him. We pray that you'd touch him in his spirit, Lord, and you'd raise him up again. Yeah, come Holy Spirit, minister to your servant. Minister to him in his mind, in his body, in his soul, in his spirit, in his heart. Bring your healing, Lord Jesus, please. And I pray for Sue, we pray for Sue, that she'll know your peace. And for all the family at this time, as you restore David to full health. Amen. Um, Let's also pray for Whiteleaf anyway, shall we? Um, particularly because David's been very instrumental in raising up a new team of elders who are now settling in at Whiteleaf. So let's quickly pray for, pray for them. Jesus, we thank you for the team of elders at Whiteleaf. We thank you for the influence that David's had upon them. And we just pray that you'll bless them as they settle into their roles. Give them unity and wisdom and favor with their church and their community, Lord that your kingdom come powerfully. Amen.
Every week we pray for a ministry of the church, and this week we're praying for uh, Noah's Ark, which um, is our preschool. I asked Jackie what she'd like prayer for. She was in a really, really good place, actually, when I spoke to her, which may have been something to do with the fact that it was Friday afternoon and the children had just left. Um, but she was in a very good place. But she did say that there's some staff illness and some children who are ill too and asked us to pray for them. So let's quickly do that. Jesus, we ask for your healing also for the staff of Noah's Ark and the children at Noah's Ark, Lord. Would you pour your healing out on them, please, please, Lord. And we thank you for all that Noah's Ark do. Amen. And um, finally, I thought it would be really good, like we did last week um, when Sue led us to pray for COP26. And um, I've been talking quite a lot. I haven't done this for a couple of years, actually, and possibly it's even showing. Um, so, I thought I'd, so I thought I'd let you guys um, pray for this bit. But, um, but I've put a couple of suggestions as to how we might pray for COP26. And just very quickly, for me personally, creation care has become a much higher value, I think, in the last couple of years in my own Christian walk. And I'm still on the journey to know how to prioritize it and how God wants me um, to act and pray in response to what's going on in his creation. But I thought it might be good, if you're happy with this, to pray first of all to say sorry to God for the way in which we've got things wrong with his creation, to ask him to show us how he wants us to respond individually, as a church, as a nation, as a world, to climate change. Because we want his will to be done, don't we? And um, also pray that he'd pour out his spirit on COP26. So do you guys just want to pray um, for about half an hour for, for COP, for as long as it takes for COP26? And Jesus, I want to pray particularly for any of us who are anxious about climate change and help us to um, give those anxieties to you, to know that you are Lord and help us to hear what you're saying about how you want us to respond to all that's happening, Lord. Help us to be faithful to you in our care for your creation. Amen. And then one, one last slide, um, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's not obvious from that slide what this is all about, but we need more helpers on the rotors. And I, so I typed in many hands make light work and that was the slide that came up. So I hope for somebody here, there's a light bulb moment going on and thinking, yes, I'll help with one of the rotors. I guess we need about 10 people all together to, um, to help on the rotors. I want to say a big thank you to those of you who are helping already, those of you who signed up recently. And also I want to say that only sign up if God's prompting you to do that. Um, and I've got a sense that when, we, when you do that, there's work involved and effort involved, but God's always promised to be with us when we do those things and that his, his yoke really is easy and his burdens light. But do ask God if he's asking you to to help on one of those rotors. That would be great. Okay, I think I'm done. And Heather's going to come and preach. Let me extend an arm towards Heather. 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 And we'll pray for her. Jesus, thank you for Heather. Thank you for all that she brings to us as a church. And we just pray that you'll give her your peace as she speaks to us now. Help her to sense what it is that you want to say through her and bless her as she speaks. Amen. Thanks, John. And hello, everybody. So nice to see you all. Um, Particularly welcome to those who've come for this really special time together um, of uh, dedicating these three very precious children. They really are so important and so special to us as a church. Um, So it's really lovely to meet um, some of their friends and family. So uh, thank you for joining us. 
my talk today is rather bizarrely entitled, sorry, you kind of, as you get to know me, you kind of put up with this strange side of me. Um, why God isn't like Father Christmas and why that's a good thing. Um, and uh, hopefully that will make a little bit more sense to you later on. If not, just, you know, it's one of Heather's quirks, it's fine. Um, but I wonder actually whether for one or two people here, um, or one or two people watching online, there's something significant in this that you maybe have a view of God that he's a bit like Father Christmas, um, and he wants to kind of challenge and change your perception on who he is. So, um, yeah, so we'll see how we get on. God is love. That's the, that's the place to start. God is love. That's how he reveals himself um, consistently um, in scripture, consistently as he um, meets with people, he reveals himself as love. And that is how I have experienced my wonderful father, God. So can we kind of like put that as an overarching thing um, as we come today to look at the book of Joshua? Um, this is what um, we've been looking at over the past few weeks. If you haven't been with us, we'll kind of catch you up to speed quickly. It's a book in the Old Testament um, which talks about God's dealings with his people um, where he promised his people that he would give them a land and that if, he tr if they trusted him, he would give them victory over their enemies so that they could um, come to take that land. And um, so far, it's been going really well. Um, so at the beginning of the book, um, God speaks to Joshua and says, be strong and courageous, I'm going to be with you. Um, and then we have, if you remember, the spies going in, and they meet Rahab, and God amazingly works through that whole situation. Um, the encouragement of the miraculous crossing of the Jordan. Um, and then um, Aaron got the, uh, the wonderful story last week of the, um, the walls falling down and the incredibleness. I love the way he was talking about, you know, if, if we had the walls here um, or, you know, any old, old wall and you shouted, you wouldn't expect it to fall down. But with God, anything is possible. Um, and, uh, and so the Israelites are, are really kind of in an amazing place. Um, and then I get chapter seven and eight. And I don't know if you've read on ahead, maybe you're feeling a little bit sorry for me. I don't know. Um, so here it all goes wrong. Um, and in order to understand what happens in chapter seven and eight, um, we need to see a little bit from chapter six, um, which um, it should be on the screen. I'm sorry it's not bigger. I tried to make it big. Um, Joshua 6, 17 to 19. And in this, basically, God is giving his instructions to his people. Um, and he says, when you go and you conquer your enemies, the city and all that's in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Keep away from the devoted things so that you won't bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. So basically, when you see a really nice looking Babylonian robe and you think, oh, I'd quite like to take that and have that for myself when I've defeated my enemies here, resist that temptation. Um, everything in the city is to be for me. So that was, uh, that was kind of God's, uh, God's command to them. Um, that that was how they were to show their obedience to him and their, their commitment to him. So obviously this happened quite a long time ago, um, but people are still the same. So who thinks that every single Israelite managed to resist the beautiful Babylonian robes and the nice gold and silver and, uh, and leave them there and give them to God? Who thinks that maybe one or two were a bit tempted and, uh, and perhaps took, hmm, yeah, okay. So we come to Joshua chapter seven. And, okay, here we go, verse one. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. And so, that has a consequence. They've put themselves outside of the safety of, of, the, of uh, the parameters that God had given for them. And so, as we carry on in the chapter, we read that um, Joshua sent some spies in to, to now I always, want, I always want to call it AI, but it's AE apparently, so forgive me if I say it wrong. Um, Joshua sent some men, this is verse two to three, from Jericho to Ai, 
which is near beth to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and they spied out Ai. Now, do you remember when they sent some spies before? Do you remember what they said when they came back? Did they think like, oh yes, we can easily do this? Or did they go, ah, no, they're like, we're like grasshoppers, we can't do it. It was kind of that, wasn't it? Well, here, they've sort of like, in a sense, they've, you know, in a sense, they've maybe learned their lesson because they've seen God doing all this stuff. But in another sense, they've perhaps become a bit cocky and a bit kind of um, sure that they can, you know, they can manage it themselves. Because when they returned to Joshua, we read, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it. Do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So they think this time they can do it. This should be easy. They've seen God at work all the way through. They've seen the walls come down. They've seen his great, great victories in the past. This is going to be a you know, walk in the park. Just send a few people. But, but, verses four to five, about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. So this time, they're defeated. Even though, technically, they thought they could do it. What made the difference? I guess God wasn't with them this time. They thought he was, but they'd stepped outside of of his plans. And so we kind of, sorry, it's a bit of a, I'm kind of trying to chop up the reading for you so it's not one long reading. Um, But we carry on, um, verses 10 to 12. Um, Joshua, I'm skipping a bit because in the middle, Joshua asks God, What's happening? What about your great name? You promised God that in order to show the world how wonderful you are and how trustworthy you are, you were gonna give us victory. So what's gone wrong? What's happened here? And here is, um, here is God's answer in, in uh, verses 10 to 12. Israel have, has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. How awful for for Joshua, for the Israelites to hear that. God had promised that he would go with them, that his presence would be with them. And, you know, they've got a history of saying, if your presence isn't going to go with us, we're not going. You know, we want you to be with us. We need you, God. And he's saying, I won't be with you anymore if you carry on in disobedience to me. And in fact, the the Hebrew, where it says um, they turn their backs and run in the original language, that is the same, the same term, the same words as is used in Exodus 23 of what God says he'll do to their enemies. So it's like they will become God's enemies. Wow. So I'm sorry, it's a bit of a kind of sobering one to hear today. And And this is why... This is partly the thing of you know God being, not being like Father Christmas, but actually why it's good that He is and will that He isn't, and we'll come on to come on to that thing um, in a bit. God is uncompromising. Um, he's not just some kind of fluffy, um, fluffy Father Christmassy figure in the sky, because um, you know. Father Christmas is actually, I've discovered, um, doesn't have very exacting standards. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've found that. But you know, you're only supposed to get presents from Father Christmas if you're really good. Yeah. But how bad do you have to be in order to not get presents from Father Christmas? I think you probably actually have to be fairly bad because, you know, you know, I, I know that I know children who get to, who get presents from Father Christmas on, on uh, or from Father Christmas on Christmas morning, uh, where, who haven't perhaps been perfect in the weeks leading up to Christmas. Um, God isn't like that. He loves to give good gifts to his children. He loves us. He loves his people. Um, 
but he's not a kind of, you know, fluffy, Father Christmassy type um, who doesn't care um, about, about the wrong in the world. And that's a good thing, which I'll come on to in a bit. So going back to the story of Joshua, um, here's what God does about it. Um, God makes the people come forward group by group and he kind of narrows down to, to find who, where it is that the fault lies. And it doesn't say this in the text, but maybe, maybe that was giving Achan the chance to repent. Maybe that was giving him the chance to confess. Um, that would be in line with God's character. All the way through scripture we see that he's a gracious God, that he, he holds back his judgment because he loves people so much and he is longing for them to turn to him. So maybe that's why, but anyway, whatever the reason, um, we go down and finally we get um, to Achan's tribe and then to him. And um, we find that he had, he had hidden it, hidden it under his tent. Um, I didn't have that one on the slide, but I guess you'd like to hear what he hid. Let me find it. He says, Achan says, it is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is chapter, verse 20, 21. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So he had, uh, he had hidden it. He'd taken it and he'd hidden it. And I wonder if that's kind of a little bit like what we do sometimes with our wrongdoing. We try to hide it. Um, but it's kind of... You wonder, don't you, though, you know, how he could ever bring it out because there he'd be kind of in his new Babylonian robe and uh, somebody would be saying, oh, that's a rather nice Babylonian robe you've got there. Wherever did you get that from? Uh, you, know, I, you know, why have you suddenly become so rich, Aiken? So, but that is very similar to, to what we do. We tend to, if there are things that we're ashamed of, um, that we do wrong, we tend to try and hide them. Um, and we've got a good story in our, our family of, uh, of Andrew when he was, he was a child. Um, he, he really liked after eights and, uh, and he took one and he hid it. He hid it under his pillow thinking that no one would find it. But the trouble is he forgot about it, didn't you, Andrew? And then, uh, <laughs> Imagine what happened to that after eight under his pillow after it had been there for a little while. The evidence was kind of fairly clear. But in fact, his mum seemed to think it was a nosebleed, which I don't quite understand. <laughs> but, and I discovered recently there's a second part to the story, which I didn't know, because I, I asked his permission to share this, and then he'd actually told me the second part of the story, was a, a further after eight. There was a, there was a gap between his wardrobe, or no, his sister's wardrobe, and the wall. And he kind of found it was just enough space to slide an after eight for, for consumption later. Um, but the trouble with that hiding place was that it was impossible to get it out again. <laughs> so I think uh, Mr. Mouse maybe had a nice, uh, nice feast on the after eight. But we can't hide our sin, can we? We can't, we can't hide our wrongdoing from God because God is God. And you know what, there's something beautiful though. I'm glad that God sees everything. And this is the whole thing about, you know, why it's good that God isn't like Father Christmas. You know, maybe, maybe Father Christmas gives gifts to everybody because he doesn't actually know, that, you know. <laughs> maybe he doesn't realize that they've been really naughty. I don't know. But God sees, but the fact that God sees us is a comfort to us because there was a, a line in one of the songs, wasn't there? You, you know my weakness and you still call me friend. There is nothing hidden in us that could stop God from loving us because he knows us. You can't, there's no point you know, digging a hole under your tent. I mean, God knew that the, you know, God saw Achan digging the hole. Um, God can see us. God sees us completely and he still loves us. In fact, I had a really powerful experience a couple of days ago um, when I was in, um, in a ministry time and, uh, and I suddenly had a really deep sense of God being the God who sees me, you know, like Hagar in the, in the, in the Old Testament. 
and knowing that God had seen some of the things that were difficult in my life was so comforting and uh, really made a huge difference to me. So it's really good that God sees. It's really good that God sees everything. So um, back to Achan. There's some verses that um, end this, this chapter, which I don't want to read, to be honest. Um, but it's part of who God is, and so I'm going to. Um, so this is Joshua 7, verses 24 to 26. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the, ro- the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they'd stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. It's really sobering, isn't it? To think, you know, God isn't like some kind of, you know, nice, nice, cozy, Father Christmassy, mythical figure. He's holy. He's a holy God. Um, And when we worship him, we worship a holy God. There's a um, there's a C.S. Lewis quote which I love, which says, um, "This is from uh, *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*. Who's seen that or read it? Yeah. Um, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion." Ooh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And there's a truth in that. God is, God is not safe, but he's good. He's good. We have to take him seriously. Um, we have to worship him. And Joshua, in fact, um, I hadn't kind of realized this until I, um, until I started um, preparing for, for today, but Joshua actually would have had a very keen sense of God's holiness because um, you, know when, uh, you know when Moses went up the mountain? Joshua was there, actually. Um, in uh, in uh, Exodus 24, 12 to 17, we read that, um, that, um, that, that Moses spoke to God on the mountain, and, and, sorry, and God spoke to Moses on the mountain. And it says here, on this, this is in the message version, which, um, which kind of brings it home to me a bit more. On the seventh day, God called out of the cloud to Moses. In the view of the Israelites below, the glory of God looked like a raging fire at the top of the mountain. Imagine a raging fire. Like maybe you saw one yesterday of a bonfire, um, fireworks day. Imagine a raging fire. That's what the glory of God is like. And Joshua had been part of that. And in fact, um, jo- it says in uh, Exodus 33, his young assistant Joshua didn't leave the tent. So that was Joshua's experience of God, that he knew who God was. So in the midst of this kind of sobering thought of rem- remembering who God is, that our God who is love, who reveals himself as love, who loves us to bits, each one of us, um, he is also holy. I'm, I'm pleased about that. Although, although it's a, a sobering message, I'm so pleased that it is like that because I want a God who cares more about climate change than the most fervent climate change protester. I want God to be uncompromising in his holiness because otherwise heaven is not going to be perfect, is it? He can't wipe away every tear if he's going to allow some bad stuff in there. I want a God who cares more than I do about the fact that a few years ago a robber broke into my grandmother's house and terrified her 
and went and stole her, her rings and things which were so sentiment, had so much sentimental value to her. I want God to care about that. I want God to care about those things. You know, I want God to, to care about the wrong things in this world and to want to put that right. But the trouble is, if we have a God who cares about the things that are wrong in the world, some of the things that are wrong in the world are in here. <laughs> My, my grandmother, the one who got um, her house broken into, um, she's 101 now, she's amazing. Um, and it, she has a little joke with me because she'll, she'll often you know, be talking about something or other and she'll say, oh, um, you know, well, there's no one perfect, is there, Heather? And then she'll kind of look at me with a kind of a glint in her eye and say, oh, except you and me. But, but we know, we know that we're not perfect. And, you know, if we're looking for, yeah, if we're, if we're aware of who God is, the more we know God, the more we realize our own imperfection. And that's why there's good news. That's why Jesus came. And if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, I want to really encourage you and urge you, you know, with all the, like, all the strength and love in my heart to, to turn to him and to accept him as your savior because he is amazing and his love is incredible. And it's because, because God loved the world so much that he can't have this, um, he can't allow um, any, any, um, any, any sin um, to taint to taint it. And so we have amazing, um, amazing verse in Romans 3 which says, yes, all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious ideal. That's what I've been talking about so far, isn't it? That's what Joshua 7 shows us. We all fall short. I, you know, I would have been tempted by that Babylonian robe. I don't know about you. We all fall short. But the good news is that Jesus came because not only is God holy, but he's love and he loved the world so much that he sent Jesus. And so in the second part of, of that, um, that scripture, it says, yet now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins. And that's been my experience, that, that Jesus has taken away my sins and the wrong things that I've done. So that, I can, so that I can worship this incredible God, so that I can know myself to be accepted by a God who is uncompromising, and yet who loves so much and so fervently that he came to rescue me. You know, why is it that we make children learn to obey us? You know, why is it that uh, that uh, Catherine and Aaron and Will and Seco are like teaching their children, when I say stop, you must stop. You know, is it because they couldn't afford to get a dog and so therefore, you know, they had to have children and try and like, you know, train them? Is that, is that why? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's because they know that there might come a time when, when one of those children is running into danger and they want them to stop. They want them to have the obedience to be able to, to hear their father, mother saying, stop, and for them to stop so that they don't get hurt, so they don't run into danger. And that, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's kind of a bit, for me, of what, you know, God's laws, God's commandments. He knows what's best for us. So as I finish, um, I've already spoken a little bit to, to those of you who, um, who perhaps don't know Jesus yet. For, for those who do, I think this is, a, this is a reminder. Yes, this is Old Testament, isn't it? And we can just say hooray for Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus. Um, I, I, did a, um, I went to a, a series of studies once on the book of Leviticus. We had this house party and 
every talk was about the book of Leviticus. And basically the strap line was hooray for Jesus. And that's what we were saying because this is, you know, it would be, all of that would be our experience if it were not for, you know, for Jesus. Hooray for Jesus. And it points forward to him. Um, but there, we are called as Christians to, to come to, to the obedience that comes from faith. It says in, in Romans 1. That's what God calls us into. Um, and the, there's something in that, um, that scripture in Joshua where it says, you cannot stand against your enemies unless you remove the sin that's within you. That kind of spoke to my heart. And my experience is that God loves me so much that he... Um, that, that he, if there are things in my life, when uh, there are things in my life, which happens all the time, which are not pleasing to him, he very gently puts his finger on them. And the feeling that I get with it is not a feeling of condemnation, because there's no condemnation for us, because we're in Jesus. It's not a feeling of condemnation, but it's a loving invitation. I experience it as a loving invitation to put those things right. Um, and to follow him wholeheartedly and not to compromise um, because we have a God who is holy. Um, so for those of us who, who know and follow Jesus, um, perhaps a, a reminder today for all of us, for me too, um, and there's been something that, I've, that God's put his finger from, on for me as I've been preparing this that I've thought, okay, I need to actually do something about that um, because I want to be like Jesus. Because, because he's changing me from glory to glory. And that's the case for all of us, isn't it? We just want to be more like Jesus. We want to be close to him. Um, so I think I'll leave you with that thought and ask um, John if you'd like to come back up. So why is God not like Father Christmas? He's not mythical. <laughs> He also, as James says, he doesn't say yo-ho-ho, ho, and then he realized, oh, actually, it's not yo-ho-ho, ho, that's a pirate. Um, <laughs> he's not mythical. He's not some kind of warm, fuzzy um, kind of person in the sky who appears once a year to give you stuff. He's a holy God who knows us and who loves us so much and, to call, and who calls us to know and love and walk with him as well. Amen. Thank you, Heather. Um, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm really grateful for Heather, what she brings to the church and how she can talk about really quite difficult things in such a loving way, so it's, it's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I knew what Heather was going to talk about. I hadn't realised quite how well she was going to talk about it, but I should have realised that. Um, and I really wasn't too sure what to say, but I'll just say a couple of things before we finish with one, one final worship song. Um, Quite, quite early on in the talk, um, Heather, you mentioned the Israelites coming out of God's protection, sort of out of his um, parameters almost. And um, I know what it's like to live like that. I mean, I've disobeyed God at different times and um, it's really painful. You can, you can cause yourself quite a lot of pain when you, when you disobey God. And for me, one of the best experiences in life is God dealing with that pain as I, as I come back to him in to say sorry or to be reconciled to him. And as Heather was talking, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I was reminded of this picture in the, in the New Testament where God says he's like a mother hen. He, he longs for us to come to him and experience that protection and that love and that nurturing. That, that he has for us and um, I'm sorry if this is a bit emotional but um, I've experienced life both outside that protection and inside that protection and it's Jesus who allows us to come to God and to have that pain begin to be washed away to, to know that protection from God and yeah let's go for it guys because there's nothing there's nothing better than knowing your sins are forgiven knowing that you're loved by God and knowing that you come under the protection of God through Jesus. Let's worship. Amen.
goodness, oh God. Thank you, Will. That was wonderful. Thank you, Heather. That was equally wonderful. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I um, just want to pray a blessing on each of you. May God bless you. May God reveal his love to you. May God lead you into all that he has for you and bless you greatly. Amen. As teas and coffees out there, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's a sort of self-service thing, but it will be obvious when you get out there. Um, I'd imagine the lunch will be ready in about 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, Aaron thinks so too. So, um, yeah, those of you who can stay for lunch, um, enjoy lunch, and everybody have a really good week. God bless. Thank you. <laughs>